to the meeting at the shelter, Church of Life Ministries Sunday night meeting. It's past our time to start, but we're going to go ahead and start a little bit late as there were conversations taking place, fellowship, and that is the ultimate goal of us being here after our first priority, which is to meet with the Lord, is that we have fellowship and we spend time talking to one another. So we welcome you here tonight. And we give, uh, of course, our greatest welcome to the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you that your presence is with us. And it's what we desire. It's what we've come for. It's why we're here. We've come to meet with you. So we ask that you would make yourself very real to each and every one of us. We ask that you would give us the ability to step aside from our life in this age. To take off our time-bound shoes and relax in eternity. That you've made us to sit in heavenly places, which means we can connect to heavenly realms right here and now. That we can connect to a spiritual atmosphere from which will come the living water, from which will flow in and through us the life-giving force of God. Lord, that's what we want. Holy Spirit, we surrender to your great presence and we ask that you would be honored as our guest here. We honor you. We give you the glory that you deserve. We give you the honor, the recognition that you deserve. We revere you and your presence above all things. We acknowledge that you're the source of everything. Every good gift comes from you. Every perfect gift down from you, O oh Father of lights. You are wonderful. You're magnificent. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for making us a part of this kingdom. We rejoice in that kingdom. We come here with the purpose to grow in your kingdom. So help us to do so, Lord. Open our eyes, open our ears, spiritually speaking, and open our hearts to receive and to communicate with you. Receive our praise tonight, Lord. We, we call into order our being, all that we are, our spirit, our soul, and our body. We call it into order, and we let our spirit dictate to our soul what we should do and what we should be. And just think of yourself divided up. Just recently we had a message that we talked about our spirit versus God's spirit. And we saw that our spirit, just like God is tripartite, a trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are body, soul, and spirit. And if you get in touch with your spirit, man, then you elect him as president of you and let your spirit bear witness with his spirit so we do that right now. And let your spirit tell your soul what to do. Like the psalmist said, Bless the Lord, O my soul. I want us to sing this song together. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O my soul. Worship His holy. Thank you. 
bands of angels gather round the throne, bowing down before God's Son. Redeemed and elders, redeemed and elders, lift their voice on high, giving honor, giving honor to the one for your is
trust you with our lives. We trust you with our hearts. We yield to you tonight, Lord. We yield to your wonderful presence. We say, Lord, have your way. Speak to us. Minister to us, Lord. Um, the children there are so amazing. They are 
but I don't get to see the actual slum because they cover it up. I mean the dumping, the dumping pit. Yeah, it's got a meaningful trip for me. Yeah. I just want to thank God for giving me the ideas because um, last September when I was, when we went to the province and the slum, I came back and for two weeks I was, I woke up blank, feeling blank and lost and. Oh, what am I going to do? Everywhere I turn, there's needs and needs everywhere, you know. So I really cried out to the Lord for two weeks and asked God for, I, for, for, for His direction. And after two weeks, ideas began coming to me and, and I had to ask Him to confirm it and He confirmed it when Pastor Pedro was here. So when we were there, um, God connected me to the people to go to the slum. So we were able to go there for the first time, this trip, and we are connected to a new... Um, orphanage which is MOC, Maranatha Orphanage of Cambodia and uh, from there uh, we found that they need, they need um, people to help them in computer skills so um, I'm able to, um, I told them I'll help them the next time when I come in so I really want to thank God for his ideas, his connection and um, to, so that we can go in and consistently help the people there um, yeah for the slums too I'm really very really glad because I had this desire to go in to go to the slums in April but there were no opening yet and um, during this time this trip there was um, you know the opening is there and we're able to go in and help to minister or help to bless the children. So thank you for all this. We appreciate your sacrifice Valerie. And thank you George for letting her go. You know it becomes a difficult nest without a mother bird in it and George has been so kind to us to allow her to continue to do that and the Lord is blessing them, giving them great opportunities to do great things. And it's only just the beginning. I have a message that the Lord gave me. I've been thinking about it over the last couple of days. This message really kind of moves towards uh, people involved in some way in ministry. And looking around the room, that's most of the people here. Uh, I believe that every believer is involved in ministry. And I love Paul's writings about working in God's kingdom. And he wrote letters to the church in general, but he also wrote letters specifically to church workers. Uh, and those, uh, more precisely, his disciples, Timothy, Titus, First and Second Timothy, uh, Titus, Philemon, uh, a little bit, but mostly those what they call the pastoral epistles, where he was giving advice about what we need to focus on, what we need to do as we are in ministry. And you may say, well, look, I'm not really a pastor, I'm a businessman, I'm a business person, or I, I'm a housewife, or whatever, I'm, I'm a professional student. We had a professional student one time in our ministry, that's what they call themselves. But whatever you may think you are, uh, you, you, will, you will always be responsible with the ministry of reconciliation, that we are to to bear the good news of Jesus, to help people. And it's good to keep our priorities in line, and it's also good to stay healthy spiritually, and Paul had a great concern about that. The title of this message is Trustworthy Saints. Trustworthy Saints. And this phrase, as I was reading through my one-year plan and recording those passages that I do, I came across this word, trustworthy saints, and I noticed that it kept showing up again and again. And it kind of stirred in my imagination, what exactly is a trustworthy saying? And, and how often does the Bible say that this is a trustworthy saying? So it turns out there's five times that the Bible says, and it's Paul every time. And it's always pastoral epistles that he says, this is a trustworthy saying. So a trustworthy saying is something we can trust. In introduction, many people are saying many things some things are good and some not so good. We need words we can trust. In the days of the Apostle Paul, we see that there was a great deal of falsity and incorrect doctrines floating around the churches. Paul was continuously warning his disciples to not entertain these vain words. And I say in a sub-note there, I've fallen victim to crazy doctrines and ran off on tangents that did not lead to truth. I, I've heard people tell me things and teach me things, especially when I was younger in Christ, that I took to heart and ran off, but they were not trustworthy things, and they were just ideas, fantastical thoughts that men came up with, the doctrines of men, and I ended up in difficult positions or even in doctrinal error until the Lord was able to rescue me 
and bring me back to the center of the Word of God. So in other words, what I'm saying is that there are trustworthy sayings and there are sayings that are not trustworthy. We need to be very careful about uh, whose doctrines we get under, what we listen to. Paul knew this. And without itemizing each of the cases where Paul tells the churches, beware of these doctrines, watch out. He actually names some of them and names the people through whom they came. He says, watch out for this person and that person. In his letters, he names five or six people to point them out as the wrong people by name. You know, he had no, no problems with, I won't name people's names always, but he had no problem because the well-being of the people of the church was so important to him, he did not want them to get thrown off. Doctrines like that the resurrection had already come and gone. And this stole hope from the people of God because if there's no resurrection to come and the resurrection already took place, then that means they were not involved in it. And the doctrine had some facts behind it in the sense that we know that when Jesus died on the cross and the veil of the temple was split, there was a great earthquake and it says the dead rose, did they not? They rose from the graves and they showed people, people who had uh, truth or proof that the dead rose. So based upon that and other ideas, a doctrine evolved that the resurrection had already come and gone. Well, that, as I said, that will rob hope from you because I'm looking forward to my resurrection. I can't wait for my glorified body. Uh, I don't mind this body I'm in right now, but I think that the other one's going to be better. So I'm looking forward to the resurrection. And if you told me that, no, it's, it's too late, there will be no resurrection, it's already happened, that would really uh, put a damper on my enthusiasm for living for God. And that's what you're going to find about untrustworthy sayings or wrong doctrines will always be something that waters down the truth or perverts it in such a way that will cause you to lose your steam or your fervor and you begin to wonder and scratch your head. That's why Paul also spoke against arguments. He said, you don't need to be arguing about words because you start getting into these arguments and, and it's just going to cause division. And he, he told his disciples, don't argue, just speak the truth and exclude people who do not walk according to that truth. Paul was pretty extreme, actually. He said, if they do not say and teach exactly what I say and teach, don't even talk to them. Don't have anything to do with them. I'm not that strict as a pastor. I know that there's going to be different opinions and different ideas, but Paul was very clear in saying, if anyone comes to you saying anything other than exactly what I have told you, then see them as an absolute... Uh, uh, pagan or heathen, don't listen to them, don't accept them. And what he meant was, of course, the gospel, but he more specifically said ordinances, precepts, and even his customs and traditions that he handed over to them. And of course, today, we don't know exactly what those customs and traditions are. We have the Pauline letters we can look at. But we sometimes ask the question, what exactly was he talking about? Well, it's interesting when I found these trustworthy sayings that it kind of gives us some anchor points of issues that were very dear to his heart that he thought were important enough as speaking to his disciples, the Apostle Paul, to say parenthetically, look, what I'm going to say here, this is a saying that you can trust. This is a trustworthy saying. So the Apostle Paul did not want his spiritual children suffering from these words that could not be trusted. Eventually, he wrote to separate the fact and fiction and even formed the parenthetical phrasing of statements that he thought should be trusted. As I said, he called them trustworthy saints. Five times in the pastoral epistles, he uses this term. And if we examine these five instances, I believe we can uh, gain an insight into areas which are often confused by eccentric doctrines of men, meaning things that are off balance. So let us begin with these. These I want us to look at five trustworthy sayings. And we begin with the first one, number one, and each of these I'm going to tell you beware, because when he said these things in context, without going into all the scriptures surrounding it, it's always in the context of you better be careful. Watch out. So beware. And the first one is self-exaltation. And we see the passage in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Now that is even more emphasis on this saying. 
This is saying, this is the saying I'm going to tell you. It's trustworthy and should be completely accepted. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, right? Right, that's trustworthy. Of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I will show mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So here as we look at it, this trustworthy saying, what I say by self-exaltation, he's saying very clearly, and I like this about Paul, and this is what caught my eye, that he said, he said, of whom I am the worst. He came to the world to save sinners. Paul did not have an attitude of us and them. He talked about the world, people who still walked in darkness, but when it came to people that are culpable or guilty of sin, he put himself in the same category. And I think this is a very healthy perspective. Because there are some people, once they walk into a form of self-justification, sanctification by religion, by the things you do, then you will begin to develop a doctrine that exalts you up above other people. Self-exaltation, which is Luciferian. Because that's exactly what Lucifer did. Lucifer said, I will set my throne up, I will exalt myself above all the other angels. And the concept of Lucifer, even from the beginning, that's how he got Eve to sin by saying, you know, it's not like you think you're not going to die, but you'll be like God. You'll be high and lifted. And so when she saw that the fruit looked good and it was something to gain wisdom, in other words, to exalt herself and get a, get a rise higher and be powerful, she ate it. And that was sin. Sin at its very heart, at the beginning of its, its birth into what we call existence, it has this self-exaltation connected. And Paul, when you read what he wrote to the Romans about what he felt of himself, when you read what he wrote to the Corinthians, he never once praises himself. The only time is a couple times and he asks for our forgiveness when he says it. I don't mean to brag, but... And he names things that he did because of these super apostles, he called them. These super apostles are coming in, those that who, who did self-exalt and decide they were great ministers and men of God and because we are special, we will come and usurp authority over the churches. Paul did not like that. So he said, these super apostles, they're not any better than me. Forgive me, I don't mean to brag, but have they done this? Have they done that? He gives his credentials of the suffering he'd gone through, all those things. But other than that, he was always pretty honest about his real state. You've often heard me say before that one of the greatest revelations I've ever had as a Christian, but also as a minister, is the revelation of me. And, and not everyone is ready to really see themselves. So God will hide you from you for quite a while until you're in a place that he can show you you. And when he opens your eyes to the black abyss of you, it is the scariest thing you'll ever see. But it is the beginning of true spiritual wisdom and growth. It's the day when he shows you and really reveals who you are, the truth about you. That's the day you decide, I will never trust myself again. I will never trust myself again. I will only depend entirely on God's grace and mercy, and I will do it every day. Every hour, I will turn to him again and say, only by your grace, only by your mercy. And that's why Paul, I think, is saying this so clearly in this trustworthy saying. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We all know that, but let us understand that Paul considered himself a sinner. Think about what else Paul said. He said, uh, oh, wretched man that I am. He called himself wretched, without hope, because I believe the Lord showed Paul exactly who Paul was. Better yet, he showed him who Saul of Tarsus was, and then he recreated him and made him Paul the Apostle. God has a way of taking people as they were and turning them into something different. 
It's interesting that, that really the turnaround for me, what I call my sanctification, uh, when I decided to completely not trust myself, was in 1995. And it came with a visit of the power of the Holy Spirit. And when it happened, I realized that, gosh, I didn't know I was that bad. And the Lord just smiled and says, yes, I, I have known and I do know that you're that bad. But I love you. And I want you to know that I'm going to take care of it because in your weakness, I'm going to be strong. And that's why Paul wrote that. And Paul, when he really began to see his faults and his darkness and his problems, he even asked the Lord to take them away, whatever this thing is in him, take it from me. And he said, don't worry about it. it, it my grace is sufficient for you. That war came on him. But Paul, really, you find himself, uh, you find him in the, in the scriptures very often speaking in a way that, that could be seen as anti-self-esteem. He seemed like he had a, uh, an inferiority complex sometimes. And I'm saying that jokingly because I don't believe that. He had no self-esteem. He had Christ-esteem. He did not see himself as anything. He saw Jesus as everything through him. He came up with one decision about himself. When he really understood himself, he came up with one decision, and that was he needed to die. And that he was only worthy of death. So what did he say? I die daily. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ lives through me now. He went through this self-mortification process of never allowing himself to have life in himself, but be completely clothed in Christ. And when you read all of his beautiful words, you'll find this theme again and again and again. So that Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Did you know that Jesus never runs out of patience concerning your weakness, concerning your problems? He will always work for you. So that's number one. Beware of self-exaltation. I've been working with ministers for a lot of, a lot of years. I've trained a lot of uh, preachers, teachers, and uh, through the years, and I see them come and I see them go. And when someone comes to me and is very proud of themselves, I know that it's a disaster. When I come, when someone comes to me and I see they have a great deal of self-confidence, I know it's only going to be trouble. The worst thing that I see when candidates for missions come is when they say, I can do it. Then I know, oh no, they're going to fall big. They're going to have a lot of trouble. When they come and say, I'm scared, and I don't know, I don't really want to go, but I feel like the Lord's telling me, I say, Amen. That's what I'm looking for. Because that's what I've been through the years. That's all I've ever been. And I think that's what Paul, Paul did. He said, woe unto me if I don't go. If I don't preach. Because he called me to do it. I have to. And I think that's exactly what Jesus meant when he told Peter on the beach, feed my sheep. When you were young, you went wherever you want. But now that you're older, as you mature, you're going to be led where you don't want to go. And if you have a problem with self-exaltation and you are the boss of you and the captain of your vessel, then you will never be able to really do what the Lord's called you to do. That's why it's a trustworthy saying to say that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom Paul considered himself to be the worst. So that in me, the worst of sinners, he said. That's a healthy attitude. That's a healthy perspective to have. Thank God for his mercy. Number two. Beware of wrong motives for leadership. Now this is a little more specific toward people who are interested in being in the ministry and doing things for the Lord. And, and because, look what it says in 1 Timothy 3, this is where it occurs again. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. This word overseer in the Greek is obispos, and it means a bishop. But religious terms of bishop are not actually what the Bible is talking about. That's man that came up with titles later on. This just means pastor of a church. In the Bible, there's three names for pastor. The least used is pastor. What we call that, the least used is the one that is a metaphor, meaning the shepherd of sheep is one shepherding the sheep of God. But the other common ones that they call them, presbuteros and obispos, is elder and overseer. And those are interchanged throughout the scriptures. 
There's elders and there's deacons. I don't mean to get into all technicality of this, but in the Bible, there's, there's elders and there's diakonos and presbuteros, which are the elders, ch pastors of churches, and then the deacons, which are the people who help the pastors in the churches. So you have those that speak, fivefold ministry, and those that help those that speak. That's all there is. There's only two divisions of ministry. There's the people who are doing the speaking, and there's the people who are helping the people that are doing the speaking. Because it's not right for the people who do the speaking to wait on tables and neglect the word of God in prayer. Because they've been called and separated. So therefore we elect the diaconos or the deacons to do the physical tasks for a season until they become what else. So therefore if they're doing this and suddenly they desire, they have their heart on being an overseer. This is a noble task. But the overseer must, must be above reproach. Uh, the husband of but one wife. Temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. And it's interesting that in a trustworthy saying, he's telling Timothy, look, if someone is in your group, because Timothy was already a minister, but he said, if somebody in the group feels that they want to become an overseer in the house of God, Maybe they want a cell group or a family group and they feel like they can do that. Then make sure they kind of fit these. Also in Titus we see a, 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 that make sure that they are these things. And, and you know, I don't know if anybody's, uh, you, can, you can apply this to me as an overseer here. Um, I'm above reproach most of the time. I may step on a few toes now and then, but I, I don't think any of you uh, I don't think I have done something that you could say that I am not above reproach with you. And if you do, please talk to me afterward in private. <laughs> <laughs> the husband of but one wife. That's me. I have one wife. If I ever considered anything else, that one would kill me. <laughs> so, um, it's safe for me to stick with the one. The one I've had for almost 30 years, that's enough for me. And for the life of me, I cannot imagine why any man would want more than one. <laughs> that's an enigma to me, how that could be of any benefit. Because it would be, it would be so labor intensive. <laughs> because it's a full-time job just loving the one that I have. Which I'm happy to do, but I, I'm pleased that I have one but one wife. Temper. Uh, yeah, my temperature's okay. <laughs> self control. I do I do control myself in most cases, except for Barbara's cooking. <laughs> then you know I, uh, I may have a little bit there, but I'm just you know I'm seeing that if I if I line up to the scriptures, uh, respectable. I actually I have respect by most people who seem to respect me. I know because people are afraid of me. <laughs> They don't want to talk. We were, Sylvia and I were talking about this today with a fellow pastor, a Filipino pastor here in the city. And uh, Sylvia kind of talks to the students in the program for me because they're afraid to talk to me directly. And even if I talk, and I'm not doing anything to make them fearful. I just, you know, if I look at them and say, oh, I need to talk to you, they start shaking. It's like, calm down. It's okay. And I made a thing today. I was talking about my pastor was cruel to us when I was a young man. He would do this thing. He'd tell you, like, as he's getting ready to preach on a Sunday morning, he'd say, Stephen? I said, yes, sir. He'd say, I need to talk to you. I said, what? What? He'd say, Tuesday. We're going to talk. Like, about what? I'll talk to you Tuesday. No! <laughs> he did it on purpose. So I'd have three days of torturing self-examination. Coming up with every possible sin that maybe did a, you know, was, what, did he see me in a drugstore looking at an exercise magazine or something? Did he, you know, you start thinking of all these things. My pastor was funny. Respectable. Uh, hospitable. You need to be hospitable. You need to take care of people. You need to do these things. That's a trustworthy saying that Paul is saying. If someone desires this. Now, if someone cannot do these things, they might want to stay out of the overseer position. Not that they are not being used in the ministry. As I've already outlined, there are deacons. The guy who cleans the bathrooms and straightens the chairs, 
you know, he does not quite need to meet all these. It does say, though, of deacons, they also need to be certain things, but it's a different level for the overseer because people are looking. Not given to drunkenness. No, I am not given to drunkenness. How many have ever seen me drunk? It's <laughs> because I do it in private. <laughs> I mean, drunk in the Holy Spirit, you may be, may be seen. Not given to drunkenness. It's, it doesn't say not drinking. It just says not given to drunkenness. That, that's part of the temperance and self-control that they know limits, that you know limits, what you can and cannot handle. And so you walk with wisdom in there. Not violent, but gentle. I hit my wife one time in my sleep. <laughs> on accident, like 26 years ago. She still brings it up to this day. I was, I was literally sleeping and I, I flipped and did something, smacked her and blood cut. And of course she woke me up, showed me, you hit me in the mouth. Honey, somebody needs to do the dishes. You hit me in the mouth. She used it for quite a while. But I'm not really violent. I can get violent. And, but it's so funny, too, concerning my wife. My wife's the only one that can make me violent. I won't be violent, but she, she no, no, I don't let her do it because I, I have temperance and self-control. So I take a deep breath. Count to ten. One, two. But that's what wives are for. Wives are given from the Lord to you to see just how Christian you are. <laughs> Kind of like brothers and sisters, too, or people in the church. But if you, if you want to be an overseer, it's good, but you need to start thinking, is your life in order, this basic order? Are you hospitable? Why you need to be hospitable is because your life is going to be spent on everybody else all the time. When you're an overseer, I, we, everything we do is for everybody else. We have one day off a week. We have our Monday. But you know what? You guys invade that Monday. You, you, you become the topic of our conversations throughout our day off. We end up talking, and I'm like, you know what? We need to not talk about that. Yeah, but, and then we start, you know, because we're concerned, and that is part of hospitality. You're open, concerned, and loving, and, and you're worried about trustworthy saints. Let's go to number three. Beware of external focus. You've heard me preach along these lines before about getting our eyes off of the external, looking at the internal, that the Old Testament is external. The New Testament is internal. The Old Testament was the washing of cups and saucers and the rituals dealing with cleansing and the things that surround us. But the New Testament is issues of the heart. And we need to make sure that our, our focus is not on external things, but on internal things. And this is where I gathered this idea in 1 Timothy 4, 7, where this phrase, trustworthy saying, comes up again. It had nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. <coughs> This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And for this, we labor and strive. That we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. This is what he's telling Timothy. This trustworthy saying is concerning these godless myths and old wives' tale, these fables of men. And... Paul's saying that, yes, these things have to do with the rituals and the external practices of things. Like I'll often joke around, you know, Christians sometimes get caught up with these little things. They want a, a, a little piece of the old rugged cross, and they, they want uh, some oil, and they carry a little bottle of oil around with them. I think it's the biblical to use the oil. It says, call them, have them anoint you with oil and pray. But there's exaggerations sometimes on the external things. And that's not really what we need to do. A trustworthy saying is that we are connected to the Lord on these eternal issues. Godliness has value for all things, whereas things, even physical training of the outside, that's good, but we need to be looking inward all the time. Command and teach these things. The Savior of all men is, is Jesus. Have nothing to do with these godless myths and old wives' tales. And, and You see these things. Superstitions, too. Be careful with superstitions. 
I was with some Christians one time, and, and somebody knocked over a salt shaker, and they threw the salt over their shoulder. Like, what was that? Oh, it's just, we do that. Why? Well, be, because it's bad luck. And I said, you believe in that? And I, they were embarrassed. It was just part of their past that carried over. I found out just how superstitious Christians can be. One time I was in the church, and I opened an umbrella inside. <laughs> That's a tradition in the United States of America amongst a lot of Christians that you can't open. That's very bad luck to open an umbrella. I come from the New Orleans area. Primarily, my, my church was more than 90% African American or black church. And, and there's a lot of superstitions with the black people in America, too. And man, you open that umbrella. Steve, you better close that umbrella, boy. They yell at me, you know, I'm sorry, what? You can't be opening an umbrella inside of Buildings, they, just, they rebuked me, and I for the I was looking for the logic. Why? Because you just can't do that. Why? They didn't want to say it because it's bad luck. Because we're Christians now. But it's amazing how many things will carry over when there's issues of the heart that are more important that we don't need to be worried about what's external. Those things that are on the on the outside. We're believers. We have Jesus, and and our issues are issues of the heart. This one is important. Another trust they said. Number four, beware of hyper grace. <laughs> you ever hear of hyper grace? I mean, grace is grace. Grace is great. Thank God for grace. But should we sin that grace would abound? Paul said there's a balance and there can be so much. And so it's interesting that it comes in this 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Here is a trustworthy saying. <clears throat> if we died with him, we will also live with him. Of course, this is speaking about your death to the flesh. What we talked about Paul saying, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. I die daily. He said to us, put to death the deeds of the flesh. The fleshly aspect of you has to be murdered every day. You have to make sure. And if we die with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. That is, the, the, whoever... It, endures to the end will be saved, the scripture says. So if we are faithful and we keep the testimony and we keep the promise of the Lord, not that we're perfect, but that we hold on to the truth and the hope of eternity, we will make it to the end and then we will reign with him. But look at this, if we disown him, he will also disown us. I just heard a song yesterday. I was listening to a Christian radio station that I, that I called K Love. I listened to it, and a lot of the newer songs I get, I'll pull off and hear some of these, uh, the new Matt Redmond stuff, and some of these uh, Chris Tomlin songs. I love them, and I like listening to keep my ear open to what's being sung in the churches in America and, and abroad. But I heard some lyrics to a song that really disturbed me that were the antithesis of this. That basically we're saying, even if we reject him, even if we don't confess him. And I realized that there was someone suffering from what Paul is saying here about what a trustworthy saying was. Be careful of a hyper-grace doctrine. Because it says very clearly, if we disown him, he will also disown us. And another translation says, if we deny him, he will deny us. And you know that if whoever we confess before, when we confess to men before the Father, then he will confess us before the Father if we confess to men. And if we deny, then he will deny. That's what it means here. Very important. And I think it's, 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 it's strategic that we consider if we are owning up to who Jesus is in us. If we disown him, we don't claim him, in every circumstance, to that degree, he will disown you. And just like I always say about him before the Father, when we confess him to men, then Jesus elbows the Father and says, hey, look at that, that's my boy down there. That's my girl. She's talking about me again, Father. But if we keep our mouth shut, and we're not talking, and we're not opening our mouth about Jesus, then the Father turns to Jesus and says, who's that? And Jesus says, ooh. <laughs> That's the way I have to think of it in practical terms because my mind is small. I like to think, what is the, I, I picture everything. So Jesus is there and, and the Father says, who is that? But if we are not telling people clearly who Jesus is, then he will not tell the Father who we are. If we disown him, he will disown us. So someone says, hi, aren't you a Christian? Yeah, yeah, we're going to church. 
kind of water it down. That's exactly how Jesus is going to sit as the intercessor who ever lives to make intercession for you at the right hand of the Father. Then the Father, because the only way to Jesus is through the Son. There is no other way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So then the Father says, what about that person down there? And Jesus will answer exactly how you own up to him here on earth is how he will own up to you in heaven. And he will say, eh, you should, don't, don't you know him? Son, isn't that, isn't that one of yours? Mm. But if, on the contrary, if you were down here saying all the time, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, if every Facebook post is something about Jesus and you're telling people, I love Jesus, thank Jesus, thank God for the blood of the Lamb, and you're offending people, with your confession about Jesus, that's exactly what Jesus is going to be doing to the Father in heaven for you. Hey, Dad, you see him? See him? Look, look, look. Oh, what, what, what? Look at that guy. That's mine. See, that's mine, Dad. That's my disciple. They love me, Dad. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Okay, I'll get to it. No, right now, bless him. Bless him. Look at him down there. They just won't shut up about me. Hey, Dad, did you see him? Yes, I already saw him. I get it. I get it. Yeah, but look at him again. Okay, son. That same way, confession. But if we disown him, he also will disown us. I like this. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Now you see there's a division here about what this means. Faithless means that you are not exercising your faith. You, you cannot muster up the ability to believe for a certain thing. It is different than disowning. And this is the thing. Sometimes people will get these mixed up. If you're having trouble believing for something, and you get into those I don't know moments, you know what I'm talking about. Like, I don't know. I, I believe in Jesus. I love Jesus. Your confession is secure. But you're believing for something specific, something in your life that you're trying to conquer, but you just, your faith is waning and you just have trouble and you're wrestling with that issue, the scripture says that he will remain faithful in spite of that. Because he will never be able to disown himself if you don't disown him. He will always stand with you. That's why the two in the temple, the one that beat his chest and said, have mercy on me, a sinner was justified. Because it was an understanding of their weakness, not a self-justification, but an understanding that I, I don't know what to do, but Jesus, I just concede that you are Lord. You are King. Jesus will take control. Even if people will make fun of you, well, look at the mess you're in. Your life's in shambles. How can you trust that? I just trust Him. I don't know. I'm not sure. I just trust Jesus. That's all Jesus needs. He's got you. Nothing can snatch you out of His hand, but you can jump out of His hand if you want to. That's disowning you and walking away. And that's why Paul brings that focus and calls it a trustworthy saying. Let's look at number five. This is the last one. Then we're going to pray. Number five, beware of liberality of carnality. Kind of got a nice twist to it. There. <laughs> beware of liberality of carnality. This is your freedom of the flesh. Don't set your flesh free. Keep it under lock and key. Don't set your flesh free. Keep it under lock and key. Titus 3, verses 3 through 8. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us, through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. And there's a whole lot of information in these verses. We're not going to go to exhaust every part, but just look at the key here. He says, this is a trustworthy saying. Right after having said this, 
He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done. This is just a moment ago we were singing it in the song. Not because of, of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. And I am a flower quickly fading, but he is our savior. He's our deliverer. And so therefore, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs. And we're, this happens because of our relationship with the Holy Spirit. He saved us through the washing of rebirth. Just recently I talked about your spirit versus his spirit and talked about the fact that your spirit is alive because the Holy Spirit brought life to it. Before you knew Jesus, your spirit was dead, dormant. But when Jesus comes, the spirit of the Lord brings life to your spirit, then your spirit becomes a living entity. It's alive and, and excited about eternity. And that's the rebirth. Nicodemus was told about that by Jesus. You will be born again. Not born just by the flesh, but also born by the Spirit. The renewal by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that renews you so that you won't have to be foolish and disobedient, deceived and enslaved anymore. You won't have to run after all the passions and pleasures of this world. And you, you won't have the malice and envy. You won't be hated. Well, some people may hate you, but you're not going to hate other people. <coughs> You're not going to walk in hatred. You're going to always find forgiveness. Always find love. If we consider this, if we go back, this is why I spend so much time talking about that regeneration, rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. That's why I invite the Holy Spirit to come into our services because we consistently need that renewal. We need the glory of God to constantly be reshaping us, reforming us. And I want you to stress these things. That this is Paul telling Titus, when you're teaching the people in the, in the church, make sure that you put emphasis on this trustworthy saying. That they're not just be freedom to do whatever, a liberality of carnality, but that you submit to this renewal. And this, this Holy Spirit changed. He says that we are changed from glory to glory. In the presence of the Lord. So these five trustworthy sayings we saw. Number one, beware of self-exaltation. Number two, beware of wrong motives for leadership. You want to be a leader? Good. Make sure you have the right idea. Beware of external focus. Don't worry about the things on the outside. Look at the inside. Look at the heart. Your relationship with the Lord. Beware of hyper-grace. And beware of liberality, of carnality. Amen? Five trustworthy sayings by Jesus. Things that you can count on. Things that you can trust. And I invite you to take those passages we covered. Some of you were taking notes, so you wrote down. Look into it deeper. I left it shallow on purpose. I didn't want to go too deep into it. But each one of those is an entire teaching. I can break them down and spend hours and hours and hours. But... It's good for you to do it too. Because you're going to see things I can't see that are pertinent to you, that are specific, case sensitive for you in your life and what you need. Amen? Okay, so why don't we stand our feet? I want us to pray to men.
just want us to sing to me. When I look into
God wants to use you, wants to speak through you, to teach. Especially young people. Young people need the wisdom of the elders. Not that I think you're old, but you know what I mean. We're the same age. We just be carrying things.
God's presence. And even when you are faithless, He'll watch out for you. He'll remain faithful because He cannot deny Himself. He's not a man that He would lie. If He said it, He's going to do it. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. He's got your back. He's going to take care of you. Just rest in Him. Rest. Enter into the rest. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. 